Hello everybody and uh, a warm welcome from a slightly gloomy York today and lovely to have so many of my pals um, getting in touch. Um, what I want to do today is to talk about what I've been doing since I left the university, which is revising Pevsner uh, for uh, the volume for the North Riding of Yorkshire. Um, so Martin, um, because we've had this technical hitch, I'm going to have to ask Martin to push the slides on. So forgive us while we do that. Martin, could we push the slide on to the next one, please? Great, thank you. So thinking about who was Nicholas Pevsner, he was born in 1901. Um, his father was Russian, his mother uh, German, and uh, he was Jewish, uh, but a very, very assimilated German Jew. Um, his professional uh, identity was as an art historian, and he he got into this very early on, and from his teens, this was where his interest lay. Um, and uh, he did an undergraduate degree and then a PhD, and he was just beginning to get his career going when the Nazis came to power, and uh, he lost his job, to his enormous surprise, because he didn't really see himself as Jewish at all. He just saw himself as German. Um, and uh, by this time he was married to his high school sweetheart. Um, and um, her name was Lola and she's quite important uh, in, in this project. Um, but he came to England from Germany and he left Lola and their two children behind in Germany. Um, eventually, he, although he was unable to get work uh, as an academic in England as a refugee, and this is something that we're uh, finding is a, a problem again, surprisingly, in the 21st century, um, but uh, Pevsner's problems were such that he worked at what he could get, um, and he, uh, he worked for um, a, a furniture firm and got interested in modern design. Uh, and he worked at Penguin Books uh, as an editor of King Penguins, which some of you will remember. Uh, he was able to get Lola and the children out of Germany um, towards the end of the 1930s, and they set up home uh, in Hampstead in Wildwood Terrace. Um, but of course, at the beginning of the war, um, Pevsner was interned, and he was interned in uh, Liverpool, uh, not on the Isle of Man, where many people were. Um, he was interned in Liverpool and uh, he uh, immediately set up a, a kind of evening class thing there. Um, but eventually uh, his various friends were able to get him released and he went back to London and uh, continued with his editing job uh, and did some part-time work at Birkbeck College in the evenings as well. So uh, he was sort of beginning to get embedded in British society um, before and during the war. If we could go to the next slide. Martin, that's it, great. So here is a little clip, which is fuzzy, but I think it's worth it. This is from uh, a, uh, a programme that was on BBC4 about 15 years ago, and it takes clips from a programme that was made in the mid-1960s. And you will see and hear the great man. So here we go. Thanks, if we could start. <laughs> same time, Pevsner received from Alan Lane, the founder of Penguin Books, the invitation which would enable him to embark on the greatest of his projects. An invitation which it's inconceivable would be made today, when publishers, like television executives, wrongly presume that the public is as dumb as they are. One day, shortly after the war, in the great publishing boom that started then, uh, so Alan Lane asked me, asked my wife and myself out for a weekend to their country house and we were sitting in the garden and he said to me, now, if you could do exactly what you'd like to do with penguins, what would you? And I had the answer ready then, of course, and one was the Buildings of England, the other one was the Pelican History of Art, this big handbook which I only edit, whereas the Buildings of England, of course, I write. And when I told him that one would involve 50 volumes and the other would involve 50 volumes, 
And he said, yes, that's all right. We can do them both. And that was that. I think he once said that his ambition was that every schoolboy should be able to afford and to carry about with him a guide to the buildings where he lived. So I think his vision was really of, of the original paperback buildings of England, which you could just slip into your satchel or your overcoat pocket. OK, next slide, please, Martin. And then that's it. Great. So just thinking about where uh, Pevsna got these ideas from, uh, the inspiration really was um, from the book that he slipped into his uh, overcoat pocket as a boy cycling around in Germany, uh, the Handbook of German Cultural Monuments, which was published by Georg Dehio. Uh, between 1905 and 1912, um, and I show you uh, uh, the cover of uh, an obviously much more recent edition of Baden-Württemberg, um, uh, and I show you that um, because that's where my father came from. My father was also a German-Jewish refugee, and uh, so I thought we'll have the cover of the Stuttgart volume, which is where he came from. So this was what uh, this was what Pevsner was aiming for. Let's go on to the next slide. And uh, the competition, uh, the academic competition, the Victoria County History and uh, the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments, two great big doorstop volumes, which I still use uh, uh, every day, um, now happily online. I don't have to... Uh, um, get them down off the shelves anymore. Uh, and in terms of popular guides, the King's England by Arthur Mee, uh, those red guides, the little guides, which Pevsner described as indefatigably bicycle riding, which I thought was nice, uh, and the shell guides, um, which were done by John Betjeman and John Piper um, and were profusely illustrated, but didn't have quite so much uh, in terms of, uh, of description, they were a rather different thing. So um, what, what you see before you is the Dorset um, shell guide um, and the, the John Piper cover of that. And I show you that just so that you know that the other half of me, um, my mother's side were Dorset farmers. Um, so uh, that's, that's my background uh, and where I come from in all of this. Uh, and like Pevsner, I had decided in my teens what I wanted to do, which was to be an archaeologist uh, and from then a buildings archaeologist and hence to this. OK, let's go on to the next slide. So uh, if you could just give it a click, that will give us the um, next uh, the next bit. So uh, Susie Harris, who you heard at the end of that clip, who uh, is Pevsner's biographer, and it's an excellent book, says Pevsner's objective was neither grandiose nor complicated. He simply wanted people to look at the buildings of England as they would look at any other beautiful object, not in an abstract quest for knowledge, but as an everyday source of enjoyment. So that's his first, uh, his, his first aim. And the second one comes with a second click. Beyond the first shock of, the, of aesthetic enjoyment, he wanted people to be able to place themselves within a national tradition and an in, in evolving culture. At the same time, it was crucial that people should be able to locate themselves and the buildings around them in a European context. This is very wonderfully kind of post-war new, new world, isn't it? I, it's it's a, a, splendid, a splendid thought. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. And how did he do it? So he didn't have, as I do, a digital camera and the internet. He looked very hard. Next one. And he had little notebooks and he wrote things down. I have little notebooks as well. And I lost one the other day and it was horrendous. Um, and uh, the third picture on this is of Pevsner and Lola. Uh, and he talked to people. He, he, uh, he asked questions uh, and he talked to the experts in the counties and in London. Uh, and, and he really talked uh, and asked questions. So the next slide I think is a short clip again um, which is him talking about how he did it so let's go with that. 
The logistical burden of producing the buildings of England obliged this most unmilitary of men to pursue quasi-martial campaigns. Twice a year for five weeks, until her death in 1963, Lola Pevsner would drive her husband round a county, initially in a borrowed car. They had breakfast, and they would get in the car at or about half past eight, nine, and drive off to their first village, house, church, whatever. Well, that is a complete church. That's odd, because pretty well all major abbey churches or priory churches were ruined after the Reformation. I wonder why they spared this one. They would drive and observe all day until about six with probably about half or three quarters of an hour break to eat a sandwich, uh, which they carried. And he would visit, look, and write comprehensive notes on the spot. So that looks as if that part is later, or at least that the windows are put in. And yes, there is the North Portal, and that is unmistakably what first half of the 30th, 30th century, these capitals with those kind of crockety leaves and dog-tooth ornament is again something which just doesn't occur before. Pevsner's method was to initially scrutinise the building's exterior in order to determine the phases of its construction. Then he'd go inside. Then he'd compare his findings with notes prepared for him by his researchers. Look, Ted, I'm still rather worried about these book covers. I can't find them in the, in the extracts. I wonder whether you can. I think we've got something on them. Well, now for Barrow. Uh, mind that dog. Now for Barrow, we go straight along here. You can't do anything else. And at the top you turn right, and then the A road goes straight into Barrow. At six o'clock, they would get to their bed and breakfast or wherever it is they were staying, and they would have a meal. And as soon as the meal was over, he would sit down and write up the day, and he would write until about midnight. And he would get up again at about half past six and finish off. And by breakfast, it was essential that he had finished writing the draft of that part of each volume that resulted from the previous day's visiting because he assumed always, I'm sure rightly, that if you left it even for a day, it would be gone. I've never been workaholic myself and I feel I have very little insight into what drives workaholics. There we go. That's the end of that. If we could move on to the next one. That's Dieter Pevsner, his youngest son, who was born in this country. So um, thinking about um, you know, all that hard work and what Pevsner's anxieties were, and I have to say I share all of these anxieties. And the first is the things that he might have missed. I'm trying to pick up the things that he missed, and there are a few. Uh, and the next one uh, is another click, Martin, is mistakes that he made. Yes, he made mistakes, and I'm picking those up. He lacked the time to research thoroughly, and so do I, even with much more time than him. Uh, the scope of the project, what should it be? He left out uh, church bells, for instance, which uh, is rather a shame because sometimes they can help you date the tower of a church. Um, but he put in church silver and an awful lot of it went missing after Pevsner had finished. Uh, and of course, he was working for publishers who are essentially quantity surveyors, aren't they? Uh, and the word length was a big issue, as it is with me. I have to expand the current book by no more than a third. And although I can take out some stuff, um, it, I spend a lot of my time trying to whittle down what I've said so that I lose none of the sense, uh, but keep it to as few words as possible. Next slide, please. Uh, and when it was finished, uh, if we have a click, here's a famous picture of Pevs with all the volumes. Uh, and he says it's only the first round which has run its course. And then the next click, this is a really um, potent quotation from Pevsner. 
Uh, I have asked users to point out to me errors and omissions. This they have done faithfully with the mortifying result that I know by now to the full how many mistakes I have made and an unsuspecting publisher has published. Don't be deceived, gentle reader. The first editions are only ballon d'essai. It is the second editions which count. Right, so no pressure there then, Jane. Okay, let's crack on with the next one. So all of the corrections and the new material were stored in London until they turned up in my house uh, in 2016, sorted into parish folders. So what was the reception of the buildings of England? Well, the first, uh, the, the first comment here comes from the editor of the Architectural Journal, if just a click, Jim Richards, whose first question of any building after he started to publish was, well, is it in Pevsna? If it was important, it would be in Pevsna. Uh, and carrying on, the next one is uh, Jennifer Jenkins, uh, who said the buildings of England have had a public influence on those who take decisions. And she talks about Tony Crossland taking them on holiday when he was Secretary of State. And she notes how many buildings would have been lost if Pevsner hadn't mentioned them and they were there uh, in the books so that people could make a case for them. OK, and the last one of this screen is Christopher Woodward walking two miles home down the Mile End Road uh, it had become a different street. A hundred anonymous buildings had become living, friendly, complex faces. A perfect London Sunday, thanks to Pevsner. And I'm having a perfect Yorkshire five years, thanks to Pevsner. It's an amazing experience. Okay, on to the next one. And Simon Jenkins in uh, England's Thousand Best Churches says, three great ghosts inhabit all English churches, those of John Betjeman, Alec Clifton-Taylor and Nicholas Pevsner. Over both Betjeman and Clifton-Taylor towers the magisterial Pevsner. He is indispensable. And it's a great, great way of thinking about him. Okay, on we go. So uh, these are, this is, shows you Derbyshire, which went through a second revision by Elizabeth Williamson. So the initial paperback copy is on the left, then the 1970s revision in the middle, and then the recent revision, which is uh, taller and thicker by my friend Claire Hartwell, um, which came out about two years ago. Um, so you can see this is what I'm aiming for. I don't have one in between the first and, and the current edition. Nobody did a, a desktop revision of the North Riding of Yorkshire. So I'm really working from what Pevsner looked at in the summer of 1963. Should we go on? Okay. And this is a postcard at Mount Grace Priory which uh, turned up in the office uh, just after I started in the office in London. And it's from Pevsner to Helen Braham, who spent a year doing library research for him in advance of him starting in Yorkshire, um, what he calls the extracts in, the, in that clip that you saw earlier. And if we go on to the next slide, that shows you what's on the back of it, uh, which is, this is very precious to me. Just a few lines to tell you that the North Riding is one of the best prepared counties we have ever traveled, not only in accuracy and amount of detail, but also in resourcefulness in tracking down odd information in odd books. I wish I could tempt you into doing another. And what a shame you couldn't come to help reaping. That's this wonderful expression that he's reaping uh, all of the benefits of that result and then uh, of that research. And then uh, he talks about traveling and asks if she'll be in London uh, in August. So let's go on to the next slide, if we may, and we'll uh, think about what I'm doing. I want to talk a lot about Swaledale um, and to say, you know, this is what he said about wreath. And I was quite surprised by this. I thought three lines on wreath was a bit curious given how interesting it is. So um, just a next click, as they say in, uh, in private eye, uh, that's it. So there was a lot of work to do wreath. Let's have the next slide. Because Pevsner missed this, the Congregational Church by JP Pritchett of Darlington, next slide. This, which is just 
thinking about the outline of wreath, you know, how it looks from the air, that big marketplace. Uh, and I had a look at what, what there was. I'm not going to read you what's underneath. You can go back and, and look in the recording, but this is about how wreath developed. And on the extreme left-hand side, you can perhaps just under uh, the prop of the aeroplane, you, uh, you can see there's a row of tall houses. If we go to the next slide, please, Martin. This is the Black Bull Hotel in that row, and the next click will show you in detail that shop frontage, uh, which is so special that I, when looking for a parallel for it, the best I could find uh, was in Jane Austen's bath, Regency bath, and I, you know, how that got to wreath, I cannot tell you. Next slide, please. And this is the little school at Reith, which is a very, very, essentially a very, very early work by Alfred Waterhouse, who won a competition to design it. Um, and then the trustees decided that they would uh, actually give the job to another architect who pretty much used uh, Waterhouse's uh, ideas and took the credit uh, and indeed most of the money. I think they gave Waterhouse something like £20 for having won the competition. Um, but it's nice that little remote wreath should have such an early water house building. Further up the valleys in Arkengarth Dale, uh, there's a church, St Mary, uh, in which he talks about the gallery, the font, the monuments, not, not much. Uh, there's a Methodist chapel and there's the Charles Bathurst Inn. So I followed in his footsteps and went up to have a look. Next slide, please. And here is the church, and it's a typical commissioner's church of the early 19th century, uh, very plain. Next slide. No, sorry, next click. And looking back, there's a, a little gallery, and then down at the bottom, you can see he had a font. Well, actually, there are two fonts. So this is what I mean about mistakes and additions. It may be that they've moved to that second one in since, it may be that it was in a different place and he missed it, who knows, but that, that's an addition that I had to make. Next slide, please. And the Methodist Chapel, you can see the for sale sign outside. So that now goes in as the former Methodist Chapel. Next slide, please. and the Charles Bathurst Inn. And I was completely perplexed when I got to this. He said, it's a Georgian building with two bow windows. And I looked at it and I thought, no, it's not. It's a 19th century pub. What is going on here? And um, if we just click again, when I went inside, there were photographs, early photographs of the building. So this shows you how it looked in the middle of the 19th century. And you're just looking side on, you can see, the pub sign in roughly the same position as it is now and it's very flat fronted isn't it and then the next photograph shows you the same building uh, with two bow windows and you can see they're so newly fixed that you can actually see the brickwork underneath it hasn't been plastered yet and the car that's sitting next to it I showed this to my late lamented dad who was still around when I started this project and said date that car for me and he said, well, it's either just before or just after the Second World War. So Pevsner was completely fooled by this building. And I thought, why did he put it in? And I think the answer is that it was the end of a long, tiring day. They were exhausted. The landlord was very good to them. He, he saw it in the half dark and didn't quite clock what was there. And just as a favor to the landlord, he put it in. And I must say, I find it easier when I'm doing pubs and hotels, if I say to them, getting into this book might bring you a few more punters. They're always very pleased to hear that, the hoteliers of North Yorkshire. So if we go on to the next slide, what he missed from this expedition, another click, just on the other side of the of the road, there was this funny little building, um, which is a, a powder magazine for the mining industry. And then the next two clicks, please. Just across the valley, 
is this huge house, which is by John Dobson of Newcastle and, you know, a really important mine owner's house. And evidently they came out of the pub, turned the other way, drove away and didn't see it. OK, next slide, please. He certainly would have put that building in if he'd seen it. So here is my uh, change to Langswage. And you can see what I do is leave Pesner in black. Um, and then I, I put my additions. And you can see it's quite hard going. You know, I've got to sort of think very carefully about what I want to put in. Um, and where he said just that there was mining in the valley, I've written a paragraph at the bottom and said what the buildings are that are still there and the ones that uh, have been uh, subsequently demolished. Um, the octagonal mill was demolished in the early 1960s and I think if Pevner had seen it, it, wouldn't, it would have survived because he would have made a comment about it. But anyway, that's, that's one that was demolished. Next slide, please. Keeping an eye on the time here. Muka, further up the valley, um, and again, he's just written briefly about the church, he's written briefly about the Literary Institute, and he's written about the Ivelet Bridge, one of the most romantic of the Swaledale Bridges. The bridge is in trees in a place where a splashing beck meets the swale, and that's about as lyrical as Pevsner gets. And I think what went on here was, I, I think they had actually had a row the night before, driving away from Richmond, I think, and through Reith without stopping and without looking to left or right and up to the CB Inn and collapsed into their, uh, into their supper dishes. And I think the following day they, they made it up and I see them together sitting by the bridge in trees where a splashing beck meets the swale. Next slide, please. And here is Muka. Here's the church. Uh, from the outside, and it's not the most dashing of churches. So let's go on to the next photo, which shows the inside of it, very plain. And the next photo, which shows that window in detail, and that is rather splendid. That's by Florence Cam, uh, a stained glass artist of the early 20th century. Uh, and that's rather wonderful. And then the next uh, slide and that's the little literary institute that he mentioned so there's a bit of uh, addition to make to that and then the next slide please this is the school at Muka, which he didn't mention and which I did want to mention it's now a little museum and there is uh, a wool shop attached to it in the master's house that you see directly in front of you. And you see there's a sort of odd model sheep sitting on the uh, on the ridge of the roof. What you may also see uh, underneath the bell coat and to the right of the school door are two plaques, which are to Richard and Cherry Keaton. And I didn't know who they were. So I went back and I looked them up. You can do quick research these days. You just Google Cherry Keaton into uh, the search engine. So let's have the next photograph. And uh, the Kirtons were the sons of a Swaledale farmer and they were very interested in wildlife photography. And uh, they found that it was quite difficult to get the shots that they wanted. So one of the things they did was to get from their uncle a dead cow. Here she is. And they took her skin and they built inside a wooden frame and they used to carry her to where they wanted to sit by a nest or whatever it was and they would sit inside all day until they got the shot that they wanted and if you don't believe me Martin will now put up for you the next shot which proves to you that this was indeed the case. There you go. Splendid photograph isn't it? And the next shot shows you the lengths and the disregard for health and safety that the Kirtons were prepared to go to. Now, I said to my editor, Charles O'Brien, I, I thought they were important and I'd like to mention them. And he said, no, no, the editorial policy is that you don't mention people unless their connection with the building is to do with the architecture. You know, we can't mention all the historical figures. And the very first time I gave this lecture, Alistair Fitter, who some of the alumni will remember uh, from the biology department, was in the audience and he said, no, they're really important. 
Uh, and I said, well, you know, um, we can't have them. And he worried away at it. And then he said to me, um, let's ask David Attenborough for a view. So he wrote to David Attenborough, who he knows through the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. And I got a letter back 10 days later, which is going to be framed on my study wall eventually from Attenborough saying they were so important. They were the pioneers of wildlife photography. If it hadn't been for them, I would never have got into it. And uh, all of this is absolutely foundational to all the work that goes into uh, into wildlife uh, photography and research and recording. Uh, and eventually I was able to persuade Charles that they are such important figures and, and that they really should get a mention. So they're now in. Okay, let's crack on to the next slide. And uh, an addition is Oxnop Hall, which I can forgive Pevsner for not seeing. It's uh, off the main road and up track and this faces away from the road so uh, it's a very important uh, 15th and 16th century vernacular hall house um, now a farm building I'm sorry a farmhouse with very nice farm buildings around it uh, and still operating as a farm uh, as, as well as holiday accommodation so this is uh, uh, this is a building that is an addition to the, to the volume. And then I thought I couldn't go without showing you the Eiflet Bridge, um, where the uh, Plashy Beck meets the River Swale. So if you just do another click, Martin, that picture will turn up. There it is. It is, it is impossibly romantic spot. It's absolutely lovely. Right, let's crack on. Uh, and this is my new Muca. Uh, um, entry so you can see there's a lot more to say at the bottom you'll see the congregational chapel brackets former at Thwaite on the Young River Swale one mile west now residential 1863 Italianate with a pair of Tuscan doorways let's just go to the next slide and here is something this is one of the users in 1972 I think um, who wrote to Pevsner, while I'm writing, may I mention another point? I've wondered whether you inspected any buildings above Muca in Swaledale. You do not mention any. Thwaite Chapel, 1864, classical, might seem worthy of mention as some other items uh, you do describe in other villages. And then he talks uh, about the school. And then he says in Keld, there are two ordinary chapels, a disused 19th century school and an institute, all outstanding. I think. Uh, none, at all, none at all outstanding, though an expert might be able to disentangle which bits of the congregational chapel are 18th and which, if any, are medieval. How much less I should enjoy life without your books. That's, that's a lovely comment. Um, now, it's true um, that, that there's a, a note from his uh, from uh, Irmgard, who was at that point the secretary to Pevsner, saying, yes, we've noted that and we'll put your letter on file. And this is to prove to you that 45 years later, the letter came off file and I used it. So that was a system that worked. And if we go to the next slide, uh, just a picture of Keld, um, which is now included. And no, they're not outstanding, but they are incredibly interesting as a group. Uh, and I've put them in. And I realised that the reason why Pevsner missed Keld and indeed missed Reith, didn't go back into Reith and see those buildings the next morning, is that he took the uh, he, he took the road that goes over the hill from Arkengarth Dale and down to Low Row. So he never went back to Reith. And then he turned off and went up Buttertubs Pass. So he didn't go up as far as Keld. So these are additions. Next slide, please. And a difficulty is that because of the structure of the book, parish by parish, it's hard to get in a, a description of the personality of Swaledale, which, of course, is so idiosyncratic. Uh, and this is just to say that I will write a little section in, in the introduction talking about how it is that Swaledale comes to look like this, dotted with its little barns. It's partly to do with the climate, but it's partly, and I won't stop to explain it now, to do with the inheritance system in the Dale, which meant that uh, the farms got split up and split up and split up. Okay, next slide. And 
I think uh, just moving towards the end, I might cut off the end. Just one or two sort of gems that I've found. Uh, this is a church outside Easingwold, and this is some 15th century glass in it. Um, the village belonged to the Neville family, and uh, there are the arms of various of their friends and supporters here. And what's fun is that that one on the left with the, um, with the three little shells, if you, uh, I didn't find this myself, the parish told me about it, but if you look at the next slide, uh, the um, the apprentice evidently had a bit of fun after he'd uh, had his work passed by the gaffer and he and the plumber put this in with little faces painted on the shelves. I love it. I just think, you know, uh, to have a 15th century joke is just absolutely splendid. I love it. OK, next one, please. Um, one of the things that Pevsner is famous for is uh, his caustic remarks. Um, and this is the little school in Hovingham, which he says is a truly hideous school of 1864 with a polygonal oriel. And you know, that's troublesome for me because I would have described it as an endearing exercise in mid-Victorian high Gothic. Um, and I am meant to be revising Pevsner, not writing Grenville. So uh, this is a, a, a detailed conversation to be had with my editor about um, how we're going to um, manage both those opinions, because uh, I feel that something a bit kinder could be said about this school than truly hideous. Uh, however, that doesn't apply to the next one that we're going to see, um, which is absolutely truly hideous. And I don't propose to change a word of what Pesner says. North Allerton Town Hall, really irredeemable, joyless utterly ignorant and not inventive either. 1873 by Ross of Darlington. Not going to change a word of that. Okay, and the next one, Ross of Darlington, while we're on that matter, um, he, he was pretty good at hideous. This, uh, he didn't build it for Arthur Dorman, who was Dorman and Long the Steelworks, um, but Dorman bought it fairly shortly after it was built. Uh, and it is an amazing pile on the south side of, of Middlesbrough. And of course, Middlesbrough was in the North Riding, do you get it? Um, and then if we go to the next slide, um, my internet connection is unstable. Um, I hope everyone can still hear me. Uh, this is Red Car, and this is just to say it's not all pretty Swaledale. And that's the Dorman Long works that you see on the far side of the picture. And, uh, and, and it's, it's dead, and it's been dead since 2015. And it was not an easy ride doing Red Car. It was pretty depressing. Um, let's go on to the next. Uh, just to say a building that Pevsner would have liked but wasn't built when he uh, arrived in Redka was the library and it's been demolished in the intervening period uh, and replaced by this rather hideous civic centre that just seems to be a kind of mishmash of everything. We'll nip on to the next slide. So there are two more of that hideous civic centre, Martin, that you don't need to dwell on. Um, it's it's grim and it replaces an interesting and thoughtful building. Uh, and this is a new interesting and thoughtful building. Ignore the rather terrible bridge in front of it. Um, but this is a youth centre that has actually given a bit of thought to its context, hasn't it? Uh, so that is a contemporary building that gets in. I'm just going to finish with red car now. Um, I think there's one more slide of it just showing you places. Uh, the first one are some flats that have been demolished since. Uh, the second is South Gare, uh, which is a glorious and remote place. Uh, on the top right is a World War I uh, radar dish, kind of pre-radar um, for listening out for aircraft. In the middle is the revamped 2016 uh, seafront at, uh, at Red Car, which is quite interesting, but I took the photograph from the building in the bottom left-hand corner, which is truly awful, and it is going to get as big a slam from Grenville as it would have got from Pevsner. Next slide. Uh, so this is Red Car as it was, and a quick click to show you how much rewriting has had to go on. 
partly because Cleveland Technical College has been totally demolished. So one more click will give you my revision. There we go. So you can see there's a lot more to say. The next slide uh, is a similar thing, and I think we'll just whiz past it if we may. Um, uh, Martin, just this is uh, just to show you uh, the rest of it. And just to say, um, before we get to questions, uh, that as Pevsner had a lot of help, so do I. And uh, this is just a list of who helps. Um, so uh, a huge number of great friends who have driven for me. It's very exhausting if you spend all day driving and then all day looking and all day talking to owners. So my friends do the driving and it's been terrific. Archive research has been done by a gang of people. Uh, dog sitters have looked after my dogs and I put in emotional support um, because the last parallel between Pevsner's story and mine was that at the end of the field work in 1963, Lola died. Um, very unexpectedly uh, and, uh, and, and took Pevsner completely off guard. And in the middle of my project, my partner died very unexpectedly and took me completely off, guide, so, off guard. So the list of the emotional support down at the bottom is pretty important, I can tell you. Um, and it's been an absolutely amazing project. I'm very, very near to the end of it now. And if we go on to the last slide, um, just to say, what, um, what are we going to do in the future? The final revisions, North Riding, um, part of Oxfordshire, Surrey, Staffordshire. I think we're the only ones still being written at the moment. I feel very strongly there should be a digital version. I feel that that should be accompanied by a map-based app. And there's a lot of work to go into how to get that sorted out and how to fund it. Um, but that will be my next project. When I hand in the manuscript, which I hope will be in the spring of next year, um, that will be the next big project to, to try and get that sorted out. So just looking at the time, it is now 10 to two and I was asked to finish at 10 to two so that there would be time for questions. So let me end there and thank you very much. And many, many thanks to Martin, um, who has dealt with, uh, who's, who's dealt with the, um, uh, with the slides because we couldn't make my computer talk to, uh, talk to you. Uh, so I couldn't run through my own slides. Um, but I think Nat is going to handle the questions. So I shall wait to hear. Hello, Jane. Thank you for uh, a really, really interesting uh, presentation there. It was fascinating. Um, and I believe we do have a few questions. So we've got um, the top one from Stacey. When you get to questions, I was interested in knowing if you feel compelled to include all the listed buildings, considering many were not listed during his time writing the first volumes. In addition, was there ever a discussion about how he rarely went inside buildings and how the interiors are vital to understanding the buildings? Thanks, Stacey. Um, the answer to, to the first part of the question is there is a whole book to be written about what's listable but not pevsnerable and what's pevsnerable but not listable. The, the, there is an intersection in the middle, but my goodness me, no, I don't mention all the listed buildings. Um, and some of the buildings that I mention are not listed. Um, so uh, it, it's it would be completely impossible to put in all those little farmhouses and everything. So no, it's not a repeat of the list. One of the things I can do is to, um, to use the bin below the line facility that now appears on the list online to add information or to correct mistakes where um, they've been made in the listing. Um, or, or just to amplify the information. So that's another project for after I finished writing up, I will go back through the whole thing. Um, uh, and I know that uh, Eric, the lister is here. Um, so I will be going back through the whole thing to, 
to amplify what's on the list. Um, and as for the interiors, well, there are some great tales and you really, really, really all should read Susie Harris's biography of Pesna, which is uh, a chunky book, but it's a real page turner. And, um, uh, and there are some great tales about how he didn't go in and how he didn't have time. Bear in mind, I will have been working on this since 2016 and I will finish it in 2021. He did five weeks worth of field work in the summer of 1963 with Lola driving. And, and you know, it, forgive him, just forgive him. He did something so monumental to cover the whole country and to give a basis for those of us who've been fortunate enough to be in the revision team, uh, a really, really sound basis from which to work. Um, and yeah, he didn't get in all of them and we try to. I'm, I, I can't get in all of them actually. Um, there are some owners who are very recalcitrant, uh, even for academic purposes. Uh, but where I do, I'm able to amplify and explain things that he couldn't, couldn't really get to grips with. Thank you, Jane. Um, the next question we've got from David. Did you have any particular problems with access to buildings? Some. Um, it's, yeah, some. Some, they are absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, the, the best one was um, uh, one that I've been waiting to see for quite a long time because the previous owner didn't want to see me, but he sold it. Uh, and the new owner was contacted for me by the estate agents and his response email to me started with the wonderful words, I am a great fan of Pevsner. So uh, last Sunday, actually, I spent a lovely time looking around a 15th century courtyard house with a tower. Yum. Oh, that sounds like a it, Sunday well It was spent. great. It was great. <laughs> Uh, we've got a question from Helen, which is, do you have a favourite building you have visited and have you learned anything new? Oh, God, I have learned so much that I don't know where to start. Um, and I probably will produce a list of sort of 10 favourites, but I don't know that there is a single one that I could say. But there are some that are just to die for. Um, really beautiful. And just thinking about where I've been recently, um, I've been looking at a lot of churches by Temple Moor um, and uh, the one at Nunthorpe, St Mary Nunthorpe, is just a delight. It's absolutely heavenly. Um, and uh, another church architect who is pretty unknown, a chap called William Sill Hicks, um, uh, beautiful churches. They're very, very mundane on the outside. And when you walk into them, they absolutely grab you by the throat. And one of the um, one of the vicars, uh, who who um, looks after one of them and said he's sure it's deliberate that they were built in industrial areas and the idea was that they you know people should look at them from the outside and think they were nothing much but when they walked in they should understand that they were walking into the kingdom of God and actually it is like that it's amazing it's just wonderful so yes and it's not just the churches there are all sorts of quirky and wonderful buildings like um the little pig sty at Filingdales um, uh, that has been uh, was a, a, a Greek temple pig sty and it's been turned by the Landmark Trust into a holiday cottage um, just outside Whitby. So all, all sorts of quirky and wonderful buildings, yes. Oh, the pig sty sounds lovely. <laughs> um, we've got some lovely compliments from Nancy and Stacey saying how much they've enjoyed um, your talk as well. Uh, we've got a question from Pam. How do you deal with the disappointment from some villages when their buildings are not deemed important enough for inclusion? Oh, there's hardly any, uh, Pam, really. Um, nearly every village has something that I can say something about. Um, uh, there, there are very, very few. Every, everywhere is interesting. You know, even if it's a bit grim, um, as, as red car you know it was it was an unhappy place and you can't blame them for that um but the the buildings are so interesting and they tell you so much about how everywhere has developed so there there are hardly any villages in the north riding that won't even get an entry well that's very good to hear um right i think that's all we've got time for today as we come to a close um but i just wanted to say again jane thank you so much for um being so generous with your time 
Um, and our next event as well is the professional networking event centered on women in STEM. And if anyone would like to join us, that is online as well um, on the 22nd of October at one o'clock. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us from wherever you are in the world um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Oh, Derwent College, I see. No, it's in the East Riding, Julian. Um, so no, that's not going to be in the, in my North Riding volume. Right, that's. I will stop looking at the questions now and say goodbye to everybody. It's been lovely to talk to you. <laughs>